Hello and welcome to my weekly podcast and video, Through the Bible in 10 or maybe 20 years. I'm back to explanatory notes on the New Testament for this season of Lent. I don't really have time to do all of the Passion Week uh, or even the death and resurrection of Jesus because we have, I think, maybe five weeks of Lent left. Um, but I think I do have time to explore the resurrection narratives. And the goal here, we'll see if it happens, is to perhaps publish my explanatory notes on the resurrection of Jesus uh, during Easter week or Passion Week. Um, so might be able to get it just in time. So today I want to look at Matthew 28. I've done Matthew 16 explanatory notes. It's been several years ago when I first started this. Oh, what was it? Four or five years ago? <laughs> it's already been halfway there and I'm not even through the New Testament, let alone the Old Testament. I haven't even started that. Um, so I thought I would just, um, I've, I did Mark 16, so I'd like to do start with Matthew 28. If you're looking at the video, I have um, a Bible Gateway up. I have the NIV of Mark 16 on the left, and I have uh, the, the uh, NIV of Matthew 28 on the right. And I want to do a little bit com of comparison as we go through. Uh, I only have Matt, uh, Mark 16, 1 through 8 up on the left because... Uh, the, the overwhelming majority of scholars think that that's all we have. There may have been a ending of Mark that went beyond verse 8, but we, we don't have it. Most scholars don't think that 9 through 20 is what the original ending would have been if, it, if there was one. Um, but I won't rehash that. I have, if you search YouTube, you'll find my treatment of that. And, uh, and I will publish my explanatory notes on Mark hopefully in the next couple months. It's mostly done. But anyway, Matthew 28, let's go ahead and begin with verse 1. After the Sabbath, and I'm reading from the NIV here, after the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. <clears throat> Most scholars also believe that Matthew used Mark as a source. So we can, we can ask, well, what did, how did Matthew edit Mark? No contradiction here, but Matthew doesn't mention Salome, uh, and he doesn't mention uh, the spices, uh, at least not here. Uh, I don't remember. Uh, I, I did a quick look back into Matthew 27. I didn't, at my first glance, it wasn't a good glance, but I didn't see the spices mentioned in Matthew 27 either. Um, um, they may have, and I missed it. But let's go ahead. So uh, Matthew 28, 1 doesn't mention Salome for whatever reason. Uh, doesn't mention that Mary is the mother of James. Uh, this is one of the features of Mark. Mark has these little details uh, like Salome, that, that um, Matthew doesn't. Matthew has, a, in that sense, a more generic uh, feel to it than Mark has. But uh, let's, let's keep going here. So, um, verse 2, there was a violent earthquake, uh, for the angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The guards are, of course, a Matthean uh, unique uh, feature. Um, the guards are not mentioned in the other Gospels. Um, uh, simply, um, in Mark 16, they go on the first day of the week, Sunday. It's just after sunrise. Um, they're, they're puzzled. Who will roll the stone away? And when they get there... Um, they find that the, it's been moved. They, and they see a white man in a white robe. Um, Matthew tells us that it's an angel. In fact, uh, an angel of the Lord. Um, whereas it's a young man in a white robe uh, in Mark 4 uh, and 5. Uh, his appearance was like lightning. His clothes were white as snow. A little bit more uh, striking, uh, maybe in the way Matthew, uh, Matthew words it. Um, verse 5 the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. I know you're looking for Jesus who is crucified. He's not here. He is risen, just as he said. Come see the place where he laid. Then go tell his disciples, he is risen from the dead, is going ahead to Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. Okay, what's unique about Matthew in comparison to Mark here? Uh, he also says you're looking for Jesus in both. Uh, Mark, again, with, with interesting his kind of more specificity in some respects, you're looking for Jesus the Nazarene. Uh, which Jesus are you looking for? That uh, should be obvious, of course. Um, he is not here, both of them say. He is risen, both of them say, although it's in a different order. Um, come and see where he's written, where he's where he was laying, also in both of them. Then go tell the disciples. Now, Mark specifies his disciples and Peter. Um, uh, 
he's going ahead in Galilee. Both Matthew and Mark uh, tell of the appearance in Galilee. Now, interestingly, um, neither Matthew nor uh, Mark tell of the appearance to the disciples on the evening of, of Easter morning. Both Matthew and Mark give us the impression, again, Matt, Luke, Luke does something different and John does something a little different. Um, but Matthew and Mark both give us the impression, if all we had were them, that there were no resurrection appearances to the disciples on the evening of Easter, but rather that his, his resurrection appearances were going to be in Galilee. Interestingly enough, Luke tells us about no resurrection appearances uh, in Galilee, he kind of kind of abbreviates that part of it in Luke 24. Um, but uh, so both Matthew and Mark uh, clearly suggest that there will be resurrection appearances in Galilee. Now here we have a little bit of a of a tension because Mark eight, Mark one eight, or sixteen eight, ends with this: trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb, and they told nothing to anyone because they were afraid. That's quite peculiar. Now, in Matthew, the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. These feel quite different. Um, so, I mean, you can harmonize them. You can say they were afraid, they told no one, and then they thought, well, we should probably tell somebody. Um, but the, I'll, I'm just going to leave, sit with the tension there. Um, some have suggested that Mark wants, um, wants its audience to say, you know, don't be like the women, go tell somebody. Um, or perhaps Mark is playing into the theme of the disciples didn't get it straight the first time either. So, you know, don't feel so bad if you've had a recent failure. Um, anyway, there is a bit of a, a tension here. Um, in fact, it's it's not only in Matthew, not only in Matthew do they go tell the disciples, but as they're going to tell the disciples, verse 9, suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him. They clasped his feet. They worshiped him. And Jesus said to them, don't be afraid. Go tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Still the impression that his, his first appearances to the disciples were in Galilee. Uh, but here uh, he appears to the women. Um, uh, now, and I may do... Um, I'm, I'm not sure whether I will do, uh, I'll have to look, but we'll do, we'll do, uh, when we get to John, we'll see that Mary Magdalene is the only woman uh, that is mentioned as Jesus appearing uh, to her. Um, so that's another mi minor distinction between uh, Matthew and, and John, because in John, it's, it's just Mary Magdalene uh, that he appears to. Um, worshiping, uh, you know, we, we obviously know that Jesus is the second person of the Trinity, and that he is worthy of full uh, and complete worship. Um, uh, we do, the, the, the Greek proskuneo has a sense of bowing down. You also bow down before a king. Um, you proskuneo before a, a king. So, um, you know, there are debates among scholars as to exactly what connotation of proskuneo is in play here uh, in the text. Well, okay, so I've I've taken Mark away. If you're watching the video, we're, we're now out of the part that's that we we know for sure in Mark. Um, I know um, uh, a friend of mine uh, was talking to a scholar. Uh, I believe it was Ben Witherington, and Ben Witherington expressed his sense that if you want to know how the ending of Mark originally ended, we're about to find out in the rest of Matthew. The idea is that if Matthew wrote using Mark as a uh, a source, then, then what we have in Matthew 28 might be the way Mark originally ended. Of course, we, we, we don't know. Some don't even think it had a different ending. But um, two, two more parts to the chapter here in Matthew 28. Um, first of all, the guards. Matthew uniquely mentions the guards. Um, and so we have, actually, the last part, the Great Commission, Matthew uniquely mentions the Great Commission. Now, Mark 16 does have a version of the Great Commission, but it's not part of the original of Mark. I think Mark's, the, part, the Great Commission in Mark 16 is probably um, a tradition based upon Matthew 28. Um, so it goes the other way um, in terms of source material there. Um, Matthew being the source of, of the version of the Great Commission in Mark. 
and Mark's Great Commission in, in uh, verses 9 through 20 of chapter 16 is later Christian tradition. Like I said, it's not part of Mark. It wasn't part of Mark. Guards report, verse 11, while the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large amount of money, telling them, say that the disciples came during the night and stole them away while the disciples were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we'll satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and they did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this day. Um, Couple couple of observations here. Uh, one is, is of course, that Roman soldiers would normally, uh, or maybe they weren't Roman soldiers, maybe they were just guards, um, but it seems like they work for the governor here. Uh, seems like Pilate's the one that has uh, sent the government's governor, uh, guards there. Um, normally, people would be put to death for something like this, right? Um, and so, uh, verse 14, we'll satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. Um, they would have normally been put to death under that circumstance. Um, the the report that the disciples stole the body uh, is is important and significant for for this reason. First of all, widely circulated among Jews to this day, if Matthew was written in the late seventies or early eighties, as I think it was, and I think that would be a fairly common dating for for Matthew, um, then we ha- basically we have a rumor that. 40, 40 to 50 years after the resurrection, people were saying, well, the disciples stole his body. Why is this significant? Well, it's significant because it assumes that there is no body. Uh, it indicates that the tomb was empty. Um, in other words, even those who didn't believe in the resurrection acknowledged that there was no body. The empty tomb was accepted, um, an accepted datum, even by those who rejected the concept of Jesus' resurrection. That's pretty significant. Um, So so a couple of things about that passage that uh, um, uh, come into play there uh, with regard to the guards. Um, Then, of course, Matthew ends with the Great Commission. Verse 16, the the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. So again, we're about to get, in Matthew's version, the very first appearance of Jesus to his disciples, and it's in Galilee. And further, it suggested that there's a mountain that Jesus had told them to go to there. Um, And when they saw him, they worshipped him. Again, same comment on proskuneo. What does proskuneo mean? Does it mean uh, bowing before a cosmic king, or does it mean bowing to the second person of the Trinity, or something in between? Um, But some doubted. That's also interesting. Um, It suggests that this appearance... Um, was uh, of such a nature that uh, you know some you could some could see it and accept and some could see it but doubt. Um, Jesus came to them and said, "All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me." Uh, interestingly enough, Satan had offered Jesus this authority on earth at least. Satan had offered Jesus the authority on earth in Matthew four, and Jesus had turned him down because that was God's business, God the Father's business. But Jesus gets it anyway, right? Now Jesus gets it in God's timing. Not only does Jesus get it in God's timing, but he gets authority to heaven as well as to earth. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Go is a participle here. Um, sometimes people, I mean, you kind of go through a, a, a pilgrimage with regard to the word go here. You know, some people say, Go and make command. It's a command. Go and make disciples. And somebody says, "Well, technically, it's a participle." And so the next, somebody will say, "Okay, well, going make disciples." It, it doesn't even argue it. It assumes you're going to go. Um, and then you learn intermediate Greek, and you realize that participles going can have nuances. And one of the nuances uh, of the uh, adverbial participle is imperatival. And we're back. Go and make disciples. And, and you'll, I think if you look at the way that Matthew uses this participle, going, it often has an imperatival sense. And so this translation is just fine. We were fine in the first place to say go and make disciples. Notice that make disciples is the, 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 the very anchor verb of this, of this uh, last two verses. Everything in the last two verses is part of making disciples. What does it mean to make disciples? Well, it means baptizing them, and it means teaching them. Um, and so you'll notice that making disciples is not a matter of, of praying the sinner's prayer, not a matter of an altar call. That may be the beginning, 
uh, doesn't even have that. It says baptizing. Baptizing is just the beginning. You're not a disciple of Jesus just because you've been baptized. But you need to go on and, and making disciple means learning all the things that Jesus commanded. And of course, in the Gospel of Matthew, especially Matthew 5 through 7, the Sermon on the Mount captures the essence of Jesus' earthly teaching um, and his earthly instruction. We find more in other parts of Matthew as well, of course. Uh, go make disciples of all ethne, of all peoples. Uh, nations is not about nation states, but about all people groups, all ethnic groups, all, all people groups. Go and make disciples of everybody. Uh, don't leave anybody out. And so even though Matthew may be the most Jewish gospel in one respect, um, traditionally Jewish gospel in, in one sense, um, it's clear also from hints we find in Matthew that the gospel is for the whole world. Even back in the genealogy, that the gospel is indeed for the whole world. Go make disciples, make followers of me, make apprentices of me, make learners of me, uh, followers of Jesus, make Christ followers in every people group. Baptizing them, this is the this is the the um, sacrament of inclusion, the sacrament of bringing bringing in the sheaves. Baptizing uh, brings a person over ritually into the people of God. Of course, in the Book of Acts, it's clear that receiving the Holy Spirit is the 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 real uh, literal moment. But baptizing, baptizing is nothing to sneeze at. Um, it is the ritual of inclusion. inclusion and um, if you believe it's a sacrament, it's a means of grace also by, by which God uh, gives us grace. Um, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Um, we have here a, a Trinitarian uh, formula, um, which, uh, it, of course, it doesn't explain that there are one substance, three persons in one substance, neither dividing the substance nor confusing the persons. You know, that that will take a few hundred years for that discussion. Uh, interesting, of course, that the book of Acts has baptism in the name of Jesus. And so, uh, uh, again, uh, I don't see a contradiction between baptizing in the name of Jesus and baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I think Luke was probably written after Matthew. Um, uh, my hunch is, is that Acts preserves the earlier formula of, of baptism, that probably uh, baptism in the name of Jesus is the way the very, very earliest Christians Matthew, of course, is written, like I said, some 40, uh, 50 years after uh, Jesus has ascended to heaven. But we can see that baptism in the name of the Father and the Holy Spirit was probably the way that people were baptizing by the time Matthew wrote his gospel in the late 70s. It may have been a mixture. It may have been a mix some people may have baptized in the name of Jesus. Some people may have baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Um, there, there, I think it's fairly clear that there's a paraphrasing uh, that takes place um, in uh, the Gospels, especially when you look at the way Matthew and Luke use Mark and, and so forth. Um, no problem. They don't, these, these formulae do not contradict each other, and I think we have a biblical basis for both uh, baptismal formulae. Um, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Like I said, that's going to take some time. Uh, and so making disciples was not a matter of a, of a day. It wasn't a matter of a year. It was a matter of, of life, really. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Remember back in Matthew 1, you will call his name Emmanuel, God with us. We have a bookend here, or what's called an inclusio. Uh, here Jesus says, I am with you. The one who was promised to be with them, Emmanuel, in Matthew 1, we see here is going to be with them forever to the end of the age. Um, Jesus, Emmanuel. Well, this has been explanatory notes on Matthew 28 and Matthew's resurrection story.